The Fun House by Diane Ho. Landers would always remember exactly where she was and what she was doing when the Devil's Elbow roller coaster went flying off its track, shooting straight out into the air and hanging there for a few seconds before plummeting to the ground. The crash killed Dade Lewis, destroyed Sherry Buchanan's face, and separated Joey Furman forever from his left leg. A dozen other roller coaster riders and ten passers by were injured. Before the crash, Tess was buying a hot dog, fries, and a large Coke at a stand near the roller coaster. Its multicolored cars were making their rattle clackety climb up the last and most treacherous leg of the journey. The noise didn't bother Tess. She had lived in Santa Luisa all of her life and was used to the sounds of the boardwalk, the amusement park along the ocean front of the town. Thanks to a mild climate, the boardwalk was open all year round. Good thing, too, Tess thought, since without the boardwalk, half the population would be unemployed. And closing the park, even briefly, would drive most of Santa Luisa's teenagers stark raving mad. Some worked there, in the shops and arcades and restaurants. Most just played there. What else was there to do in town? Tess had been wearing jeans, boots, and a heavy sweater. She had been waiting for her best friend. Gina Jamboni. Gina was always late, but she was fun and cute, and she dated a lot. She was as short and round as Tess was tall and skinny, with dark curly hair framing her olive-skinned face. Gina never seemed to be nervous or upset, and Tess envied her. Maybe it was because Gina was part of a large, happy Italian family of six kids. Tess's mother had died when Tess was nine years old. When she was 13, her father, Guy Joe Landers Sr., had married Shelley, who was much younger than he. Now they had separated. Their marriage had lasted until just six weeks ago, when Shelley had packed her things and left, taking Tess with her. Now Shelley had decided she needed a two-week holiday in Europe with her best friend, Madeline. Shelley had given Tess the choice, either stay with her father and brother at the mansion or hang out on her own at Shelley's apartment. At 17, Shelley said, Tess was old enough to take care of herself. Tess wasn't so sure. The shadows, the exclusive condominium complex where she and Shelley lived, was set deep in the woods, on a hill above the town. It was beautiful during the day, but it could be cold and lonely when darkness fell. On the other hand, Tess had no desire to stay with her father and her brother, Guy Joe Jr. She couldn't forgive Guy Joe for choosing to live with their father. She couldn't even understand it. Their father had always been too busy for his children. Well, at least he's my real parent, Guy Joe had said pointedly. Okay, Tess thought. So Shelley was their stepmother. But at least she could be fun. And her father hadn't even tried to stop her when she decided to live with Shelley. Tess was deep in thought when Gina came up to her. Hi, Tess. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Gina, <laughs> you shouldn't sneak up on people like that when I'm eating a hot dog. I could choke to death. My hair probably turned white. <laughs> Your hair is still the same mousy shade it always was. Oh, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> Why are you in such a good mood tonight? Because I see Doss Beecham over there working in the ring toss booth. Mm -hmm. I think I'm making some progress with him. He stopped calling me Jam Boney. He actually said, hey, you, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you see in that guy anyway. 
mess. Oh, he's just a big bruiser in a white t-shirt. He spends more time combing that mess of black hair than he does anything else. He's cute. Besides, huh. I feel sorry for him. Doss used to be one of us, remember? Just because his father lost all their money, everyone looks down on him now. No, no. Gina, people look down on Doss because he's a grouch who thinks the world owes him a living. That's unfair. Tess knew that the Beecham family weren't exactly starving to death. They still owned their big house on the hill, which they bought for cash years ago, and Tess had heard that Doss paid the taxes on the house out of his earnings. That was something in his favor. He hadn't let his family get tossed out on the street. Well, Gina... Where's Beak tonight? He's probably playing skee-ball, and you're about as subtle as a <laughs> jackhammer. I like Beak. You know that, but how would you like to date a guy named Beak? Oh, come on, Gina. <laughs> you know, that doesn't matter. It's just a name. Tess liked Beak, or rather, Robert Rapp, which was his real name. At 18, his features were perfectly proportioned, which hadn't been the case when he was younger, and his nose had been the most prominent feature on his thin face. Beak liked pulling practical jokes, but he was nice. Doss was a different character altogether. Hey, Tess. How you doing? Hi, Doss. Hi. Hi. Okay, Tess, uh, so where's Sam? <laughs> Gina, how should I know? I don't own Sam Oliver. Hey, Tess, who rattled your cage? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I saw Sam back there, alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you two split? Never mind, Doss. Hey, why don't you and Gina order your food while I check out the girls' room, okay? okay? I'll be right back. Bye. Tess didn't feel like hanging around while Gina got to know someone who was probably all wrong for her. But then, who was right for anybody, Tess thought. Her father hadn't been right for Shelley. And not too long ago, Tess thought Sam Oliver was perfect for her. Wrong. Tess pushed open the creaky old metal door to the restroom opposite the devil's elbow. She heard the rattle clatter of the roller coaster as it headed up to the top of its highest climb. Tess didn't mind scary rides, but she hated the roller coaster. She had ridden it once when she was nine years old. Never again. Her heart had thudded for hours after. She came out of the restroom just in time to see the roller coaster begin its last thundering descent. She imagined what it would feel like. The wind hitting her face, the air heavy with screams and shouts, the last plunge seeming to take forever, but actually lasting only a second, then that moment of relief as the train reached the last gentle curve before coasting back home. That was the way it was supposed to happen, but not this time. This time it was horribly, shockingly different. This time, instead of following the track, the lead car sailed out into the air, hung there for a second or two, then plunged downward to the boardwalk below, dragging the remaining eleven cars after it. Tess stood huddled against the wall. She couldn't believe what had happened in front of her. Then something caught her eye. A figure in black slipped out from underneath the tracks. Black slacks, black turtleneck sweater, black ski mask, a moving shadow blending into the darkness. Tess saw the figure as just a blur, but something struck her as strange. Instead of rushing to the boardwalk to help, the figure was moving away from the scene. Was it going for help, Tess wondered? But why not use the phones nearby? And what was it doing under the devil's elbow in the first place? <laughs> They asked for it. They did. They had it coming, all of them. They get no sympathy. <laughs> they think it was an accident. Wrong. It was so easy climbing up inside the roller coaster support system like a monkey in a palm tree, jamming the lead pipe up through the rails at exactly the right moment. <laughs> easy. It was so easy. Dave, Sherry, Joey, three out of eight all at the same time. Not bad. Five more to go. No one suspects. And I'm not about to tell. Not until the job is done. Right now, 
it's time to plan the next step. shuddered as she looked at the horror in front of her. She heard the ambulance coming in the distance and wondered for an instant who had called it. Maybe the figure in black she'd seen under the devil's elbow. They're going to need more than one ambulance. What happened, Tess? Um, I was just driving by. And... I, I don't know, Sam. The, the roller coaster just sailed off into the air. Come on, you guys. Why don't we see if we can help? There's Sherry Buchanan. She's hurt real bad. Oh, no. Dave Lewis is dead. <gasps> He's dead. What? Oh, my God. They just found Joey Furman. He's lost a leg. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> Joey Furman was on the track team, Tess thought, with Guy Joe, Sam, and Beak. With relief, she spotted Beak among the volunteers, trying desperately to clear away bits of twisted metal. At least he hadn't been on the devil's elbow. It was his favorite ride. Tess leaned against Sam, all her breath suddenly gone. Here, take my Walkman, Tess. I'm going with Doss to help. Well, I'll come too, Sam. No, you stay here with Gina. Try to keep the crowds back and stay out of the way. Tess hated taking orders from Sam, but she had to accept that he was probably right. She and Gina spent the next hour trying to help the police move people away from the scene so the emergency personnel could get in. When the last of the ambulances had left, she and Gina sank down beside a candy booth, exhausted. Doss and Sam joined them. Then Tess's brother, Guy Joe, arrived. Tall and broad-shouldered with a square, handsome face and deep gray eyes, he sat down beside Tess and patted her shoulder. Well, sis, at least you weren't on it. Oh, hi, Guy Joe. Thanks for worrying about me, but I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, as soon as I saw the TV news bulletin, I thought of you. I know this is your favorite hangout. Uh, well, I'm okay. A tall, big-boned, pretty girl with thick blonde hair down to her shoulders ran up to them. Trudy Slaughter was dressed in beige silk slacks over a red leotard. She moved with quick, light steps across the boardwalk and crouched beside Gina. She was careful, Tess noticed, not to let her silk pants get crushed. Isn't this just awful? I can't believe it! My daddy's gonna have a stroke! Something like this happening on his beloved boardwalk. Trudy Slaughter's father was chairman of the board of directors that ran the boardwalk. She was Tess and Gina's classmate, and a popular, powerful force at Santa Luisa High School, having been elected at least once to every available office. But Tess didn't vote for Trudy anymore. She had seen her lose her temper once in the school parking lot over a low English grade, and the sight of Trudy ripping up paper and slamming her books against a car windshield had not been pretty. I was at ballet class when we heard it. We thought it was an earthquake. Madame Suska turned on the radio, and when we heard the news, she excused us from class. And she never excuses us from anything. I suppose that means we'll have to make it up another time. Poor you. And yes, we're all fine. Thanks for asking. Well, I can see that. How did it happen, anyway? No one knows, Trudy. Maybe a loose rail. I saw someone. Under the devil's elbow? Right after the accident. Running away. Well, don't keep us in suspense. Who was it? You saw someone running away? Well, I think so. It was awfully dark, but there was something... Who did it look like, Tess? Anyone we know? No, not really, Doss. I just... I just thought there was something familiar about the way it moved. The way what moved? Oh, Beak. Tess thinks she saw someone running away from the accident. What? Why would they be running away? You mean you think someone did something to the devil's elbow? No. What, deliberately caused it? No, accident? Beak, Maybe I Maybe you just... should tell the police what you saw. What's Relax, going? Chalmers will look into it. Oh, oh Chalmers, yeah. our distinguished police chief. Come on, Doss, he couldn't find his nose without a mirror. Besides, the board got him elected to protect their precious boardwalk. Even if he does find something, like faulty equipment or actual tampering, he's not going to announce it publicly. It's bad for business. Yeah. Oh, Sam, you're so cynical. The board and the police wouldn't hide something like that. We'll see. Anyone know who called the paramedics? 
Martha did. You know, the old lady who runs the shooting gallery? Yeah. She never believed she could move so fast. That's what you did in an emergency, Tess thought grimly. You ran towards the phone, not away from it. Not unless you had good reason to run away. I found it in the attic, looking for ski clothes, a journal, a little red book at the bottom of an old trunk, the name on the front in cheap gold letters was Lila O'Hare. O'Hare? No O'Hare in this family, none in Santa Luisa for that matter. I read that journal, every page all day in that hot, stuffy attic, sweating and reading. When I finished reading it, I knew nothing would ever be the same again. You see, the journal was written by this woman named Lila O'Hare. She was married to a guy named Tully O'Hare, who owned the boardwalk. I never thought about who owned it before my father and his friends bought it. Now I knew. Some man called Tully O'Hare. Lila and Tully ran the boardwalk together. Very happy they were. Then suddenly the entries changed. I wish someone could help I us. Wish someone could help we us. Can't pay the taxes we can't pay the taxes on the boardwalk. Tully's afraid we're going to lose everything. It's our whole life. Tully's grandfather built the boardwalk, and it's all we've got. What will Tully do if it's taken away from us? We were so excited about the baby coming. We've waited and hoped for so long. Tully's worried we won't be able to take care of our child. He's going to see Buddy. Maybe he'll give us a loan. Who was Buddy? I didn't know of a banker in town named Buddy. Turns out, I didn't know a lot of things. Well, guys, I think I'm going to head home. I'm beat. Yeah, okay. Bye. Bye. See you later, Tess. Take okay. Hey, I'll walk with you, Tess. <sighs> Looks like the booze are being shut down already. Yeah. Well, who would want to stay around here tonight? So, Shelly take off for Europe yet? Yes, she left around 5 o'clock. That's great. Oh, let's not argue about her again, Sam. She's okay as a stepmother. Who's arguing? I'll drive you home. You can pick up your car tomorrow. I can drive myself, thanks. You are so stubborn. You never give an inch. Tess felt like laughing. She'd been giving in to people all her life. But it seemed that doing what people told her hadn't worked out so well. Just when she'd thought she was finally going to have a happy family like other people, her father had said, we're divorcing. And that was that. Maybe it was time to make a few decisions for herself. I'm going home. Fine. You do that. Watching him go, Tess was surprised to discover that she was analyzing Sam's walk, comparing it to the movement of the figure in black, who had run away from the boardwalk. If it was Sam I saw under the devil's elbow, he would have told me when I mentioned seeing someone running there. Then who was it? And why did they run away? Well, maybe I'm jumping to conclusions as usual. I suppose the person in black could easily have joined the volunteers at the accident without me knowing it. Tess tried to put the tragedy out of her mind as she drove up the hill towards home. She loved this drive in the daytime. The woods on either side of the road seemed peaceful and romantic. But not tonight. Not with those horrible screams echoing in her ears. At the top of the hill, she took a sharp right turn into a long tree-lined driveway leading to the shadows the exclusive condominium complex she and Shelley now called home. Their unit was right at the back, overlooking a lush green valley, a beautiful view in the daytime, but isolated and lonely at night. And this would be Tess's first night alone in the house. Tess parked the car in the carport and hurried across the patio through the small metal gate to the back door. Coming into the kitchen, she flicked on the light. The house seemed very empty. No Shelley fixing a drink. No loud jazz music blasting through the rooms. Only the wide, gaping blackness of the big picture windows over the sink. There were no curtains. Shelley didn't believe in them. She said she liked to bring the outdoors in where it belongs. 
Tess usually found that funny. But not tonight. Now the bare black windows made her feel very exposed. Hello? Hi, Tess. Oh, hi, Gina. Hi, I just wanted to make sure you got home in one piece. You seemed pretty rattled. Yeah, I guess I still am. Aren't you? Oh, well, I feel just horrible about it. Are you alone or is Sam playing bodyguard? I'm alone. Shelly's off to sunny Italy, and I didn't feel like dealing with Sam tonight. Oh, I understand. Hey, Gina, hasn't the boardwalk been in business for about a hundred years? Give or take a year or two. Why? Well, there's never been an accident on it before tonight, right? Not a really bad one, I mean. Not on the devil's elbow, but something might have happened in the funhouse. I remember my dad saying something about it once. Whatever it was, it happened before our dads bought the boardwalk and remodeled it. Why? What's up? Well, don't you think it's kind of weird? I mean, after all these years, all of a sudden there's this terrible accident? Tess, if you were a hundred years old, don't you think you might break down a little too? Well, tell the truth, Gina. Do you really think it was an accident? What are you thinking? That someone put a bomb on the rails? Santa Luisa isn't exactly terrorist territory. No, I, I know. I Tess, just... you've been listening to Sam, haven't you? Don't. You know how cynical he is. Gina, I'm the one who saw something, remember, not Sam. Why don't you just wait and see what the police come up with? I'll bet you my new purple blouse it was just a worn-out rail on the tracks. No, thanks. I'm not in a betting mood. Oh, thanks for calling, Gina. See you tomorrow. See ya. Tess didn't want to continue the argument. Besides, she had just spotted something on the floor. A piece of crisp white paper was sticking out from underneath the French doors. She picked it up. Scrawled on the front of the folded paper, in bright purple magic marker, was her own name. Tess opened the note. The words, like her name, were written in that same vivid purple. Her eyes wide, her hands beginning to shake. Tess read, Dade and Sherry went up the hill, with Joey right behind them. Now Dade is dead, and Sherry's ill, and Joey's leg can't find him. If Dade was one and Sherry two and Joey number three, who will be next? Could it be you? Why don't we wait and see? What? I delivered my little note to Tess. Hope it shakes her up. She deserves it. But she doesn't know why. No one knows until I tell them. You see, that little red book held secrets. I read it all up there in that hot, sticky attic. I learned that after Tully O'Hare went to get a loan at the bank from his friend, Buddy, Lila, his wife, wrote, I can't believe it. Buddy turned him down. He and Tully have been friends since grade school, and he won't throw him a rope when he's drowning. What are we going to do now? So who was this guy? Bad Buddy the banker? The journal was dated a long time ago. Maybe he changed his name or left the bank. And then I read the next entry. We found out why Buddy turned us down. He and his friends want the boardwalk as an investment. They say they have the funds to make it a huge money-making proposition. And we don't. But it's ours. It's all we have. They can't take it away from us. Can they? Yes, they can. I know it. I've seen my father making deals all these years. He had the money and the power, and he always won. I was right again. This was the very next entry. It's gone. The boardwalk's gone. Buddy and his friends took it. Tully is devastated. So am I. What will happen to us now? How will we take care of our baby when it comes? The next few pages were blank. The blood in Tess's veins turned cold as she read and reread the note. What does this mean? Who will be next? Next as in next after Dade and Sherry and Joey? As in look what happened to them? Tess slid down onto the floor, staring at the paper in her hand. Was it some kind of a joke? But she didn't know anyone with such a bizarre sense of humor. Tess stood up, keeping her eyes away from the blackness of the windows. 
she suddenly realized that the person who had written the poem could be watching her right now. I shouldn't stay here tonight. I could go to my dad's. I'd be safe there, but miserable. He'd start writing again with all that stuff about Shelley, or I could call Sam. He'd come and stay with me. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm so tense I'd probably fall right into his arms. That's all I need. Tess picked up the phone and dialed her father's number, letting it ring eight or nine times. No answer. Why wasn't Guy Joe home, she thought. Maybe Trudy had talked him into giving her a ride home. Trudy didn't have a curfew, and her parents were always out socializing. So who knew when Guy Joe would call it a night? If I have to spend the night alone, I'd rather spend it here, in my own house. Anyway, the stupid note was probably just a rotten joke. Tess began locking all the windows and doors. Then she pushed the heavy oak table in front of the French doors. She made her way through the condo, flipping on light switches as she went. She loved the large and airy rooms, decorated by Shelley in fresh light colors, with plants hanging down in wicker baskets. This home was prettier, warmer, and cozier than her father's mansion. But as she went from room to room, Tess suddenly found herself wondering how she would defend herself if someone broke in. She picked up a heavy brass poker from beside the fireplace and placed it beside her on the large couch. She put a quilt over her legs and turned on the television for company, resolving to stay alert till daylight. But the horror of the night had exhausted her, and she closed her eyes. When Tess finally gave way to sleep, every light in the house was still blazing brightly. <laughs> Tess woke early with sunlight streaming through the living room window. When the events of the night before flooded into her mind, she decided to drive straight down to the police station. <sighs> Chief Chalmers isn't here on Sundays. His day of rest. Not today, though. Right now, he's seeing to that mess over there at the boardwalk. Oh, I need some help. Will you read this? What is this? You got a problem, little lady? You missing a boyfriend? I'm not little, and my problem isn't a boy. It's that note. Someone slid it under my door last night. Well, could you look at it, please? Mm, this doesn't make sense. Looks like a kid's handwriting to me. Written in crayon, right? Magic marker. And it wasn't <laughs> written by a kid. Don't you recognize those names? Yeah, yeah, sure. They're the kids that were hurt last night. Terrible accident. Yeah, but doesn't that note sound like it wasn't an accident? Isn't it a warning that there might be other accidents? Could be, I guess. Could be a joke. Someone trying to scare you. You have a fight with your boyfriend lately? My boyfriend would never write a crazy note like this. <sighs> Look, miss, Chief Chalmers has his hands full right now, but as soon as he comes in, I'll give him this. If there's anything connecting this note with the crash, he'll probably call you, okay? Well, could I have my note back, please? I'd better keep it, miss. We'll follow up on this, I promise you. <clears throat> Tess watched him put the note in the drawer and knew he wouldn't do anything about it. Later, she met Gina at the ice cream shop. Mm, it's not that I don't believe there was a note, Tess. It's just that it has to be a joke. A really mean one, but a joke. I hate to see you get all upset over it. Oh, Gina, doesn't it sound to you like it means the crash was no accident? Oh, let's wait and see what the police say, okay? Come on, relax. Finish your chunky monkey ice cream. <laughs> By the way... I asked my dad about any other accidents at the boardwalk. He hates talking about stuff like that. But he did say that some guy committed suicide in the funhouse a long time ago. He hung himself. Oh, yuck. No kidding. No wonder I was never crazy about that place. Who was it? Daddy wouldn't say. I wonder why we never heard about it before. It happened before we were born. Oh. I guess it's not the kind of thing people like to talk about. No, I guess not. Hey. Don't get uptight about the note. Let's wait and see what Chief Chalmers comes up with. Just don't be surprised if it turns out I'm right. And I am going to say <laughs> I told you so. Sure you will. Look, why not stay at my house tonight? No school tomorrow, did you know? It's closed out of respect for Dade. Tess gratefully accepted Gina's offer to stay overnight. She knew Gina's house was packed to the roof with kids and toys and pets so it would be safe and relaxing. That evening at the Jambonis, nobody even mentioned the devil's elbow. But lying in her bed that night, Tess couldn't get to sleep. Those vivid purple words in magic marker kept 
dancing in front of her eyes. Who will be next? It could be you. It could be you. It could be you. Could be you. Could be you. I saw her. She went to the police with my poem. They laughed at her, I bet. Have to hand it to her, though. She stayed right there in the condo. <laughs> with all the lights on. Then last night she slept at the Jambonis. Okay by me. There's plenty of time. After all, Lila O'Hare's journal was there a long time before I read it. Lila left those blank pages in her diary after she and Tully lost the boardwalk. But then... She began writing again. My Tully is gone. People are saying that what he did was cowardly, but Tully was no coward. He did it for me and the baby. He didn't know, that poor sweet man, that the insurance company wouldn't pay off in a suicide case. How am I going to take care of our baby when it comes? The man was dead? I bet those guys who took the boardwalk from him didn't even feel guilty. My dad wouldn't. He'd say, look, the guy couldn't hack it. Is it my fault? Well, yes, actually. It could have been. If my father had been in on that deal, I hoped he hadn't, but... Look, the journal was in this trunk, in this attic, in this house. I read on. Buddy came to see me. He said I shouldn't worry. He'd take care of everything. Said they all felt guilty about buying the boardwalk. They never thought it would drive him to suicide. They didn't buy it. They stole it. But I have to let Buddy help me. I have no choice. I couldn't read any more right then. I had these tiny little hammers tattooing the inside of my skull. As Tess was leaving the Jambone's house the next day, Gina gave her a present. Come on, Shirley. Come on. Come on. Here, Shirley. Come on. Come on. Oh, here you go. Here, Tess. Oh. <laughs> Take Shirley for company. She's our most affectionate cat. She loves to be petted. You can keep her until Shelly gets back. Oh. Oh, thanks, Gina. She's beautiful. <laughs> Hello. I love cats. <laughs> Is she trained as an attack cat? <laughs> oh, sure. She's Tess put Trilby on her lap. She purred all the way home. When she got there, Tess went to her room and changed into her jeans and a yellow sweatshirt. Suddenly, the phone rang. Hello? Hi again, Tess. Listen, you probably won't be crazy about this idea, but my dad asked me this morning if I could get a bunch of kids together to go to the boardwalk. Just to show people that it's safe, you know. Beak and Sam are coming, and I think Guy Joe. Trudy might come, and Candace, too. Oh, Gina, I don't want to go down there. Why can't we do something else? Come on, Tess. My dad hardly ever asks me for anything. Can't you come with me? Tess wanted to help. Gina's father had always been very kind to her, but she didn't want to go near the boardwalk. She knew that criminals often return to the scene of their crime. Still, she couldn't say that to Gina. Okay. I'll come. Oh, great. Listen. We'll just hang around in the fun house, okay? No rides, not when you're so uptight. Could you pick me up? Yeah, sure. The fun house has no windows, so... Well, I won't be able to see the devil's elbow. Maybe it won't be so grim. <laughs> <laughs> if it was, it'd have to be called the Grim House, and nobody would go, and we'd all be poor. <laughs> yes, hung up. Then she remembered she hadn't asked Gina if her father had heard from Chalmers about the investigation. She didn't want to ask her own father... He'd only make fun of her fears if she told him about the note. She'd rather talk to her friends about it. But when they all met and she asked them, nobody in the group knew anything about the investigation, except that the roller coaster was roped off with signs saying, closed for repairs, and hardly anyone was about on the boardwalk. They all headed for the funhouse, with Gina, cheerful as always in her red shorts and flowered shirt, leading the way. Tess knew that Gina was trying to keep everyone's mind off the crash, but it didn't help. The screams of the victims still echoed in Tess's head. She kept looking over her shoulder. She had the strange feeling that someone was watching her.
The fun house was a long, narrow tunnel built in an L shape. The foot of the L was built out over the beach and was supported by wooden stilts. The dark wooden structure contained several small balconies which separated one chamber from another. When people reached the balconies, they could relax and take in the scenery before going on to the next challenge. Tess survived the tossing and tilting of the first tunnel, then stopped on one of these balconies to let her stomach settle down. Gina, Trudy, and Candace went on to the third chamber, a nylon-padded tunnel with a floor of heavy metal chain links. On the balcony, Tess breathed in the cool, salty air of the sea. But she felt uneasy. She couldn't stop thinking of the man who had committed suicide in the funhouse long ago. Tess was lost in thought when Guy Joe came up beside her. Are you sick, Tess? Mm-mm. I'm just catching my breath. Oh. You go ahead with the others. Hey, Beak's still back there clowning around as usual. He got hung up on the tilting tunnel. <laughs> Sam's gone back to give him a hand. Guy Joe? Hmm? Do you think the crash was an accident? Now tell the truth. Oh, well, who knows? Anything's possible, right? The question is, why would someone do something so awful? Yeah. Just then, Sam and Beat caught up with them, and they all headed back inside. Tess always found that the hardest part of the funhouse for her was the chamber with no solid floor. All it had was a cluster of whirling metal saucers. There was nothing to grasp onto for balance except folds of black nylon on the walls. Tess had discovered that the only way she could make it across this chamber was by lowering herself to a sitting position and sliding from saucer to saucer on her backside. It took longer, and it seriously dented her dignity, but it worked. Tess had started to do this when she realized that she was tired of feeling like a fool, tired of trying to keep her balance on moving boards, chains, and circles. She just wanted to go home. She decided then not to use the steps down from the funhouse, but to get out the quickest way possible by sliding down the steep metal chute that led directly to the beach. She landed at the bottom, her legs sprawled in the sand. Trudy, Candace, and Gina were already there, watching the surf pounding on the shore. Beak, Sam, and Guy Joe followed Tess down the chute. Listen, um, guys, I'm going to split. Oh, oh not God. already, Tess. Yes. Oh, Gina, my head is cracking right down the middle. I need to sleep. Oh, hey, wait, my keys are gone. I put my key case in my back pocket so I wouldn't have to lug my purse around with me. Sure. Oh, no, it must have fallen out in the fun house. Oh, Gina, my stomach can't handle that place again. I'll go. It's your red leather key case, right? Uh-huh. The one with your initials on it? Oh, you'll never find it in there, Gina. Get maintenance look for it. Why doesn't Tess go herself? They're her keys. We'll all go. Don't be silly, Sam. I'll go and I'll be right back. I know the place like the back of my hand. Hey, where's Gina going? To find Tess's car keys. Why does she have to look for him? Well, oh, for heaven's sakes, Doss, I'll go, okay? I'll go. Tess hated to go into the fun house again. But after all, they were her keys, and she couldn't let Gina search for them alone. She entered the rolling wooden walkway and clutched at the padded walls. Gina? Gina? I'm in here, Tess, but I can't find... <gasps> Gina? Gina, where are you? Stumbling along the wooden walkways, Tess came to the chamber with the floor of metal saucers. They were separated by small spaces, through which you could see the hard sand of the beach far below. The tiny spaces provided no danger, unless any of the large round circles was missing. And right now, one was. Tess couldn't believe it. There was a large gap in the flooring. She edged over and looked down. Below her, on the sand... She could see a small green plastic pail left by a careless child. Beside it, her left leg sticking out at a sickening angle, her face twisted in agony, was Gina. Lying very still. Why did Gina get in the way like that? Tess should have gotten her own keys. It was a cinch slipping them out of her pocket in the dark. My plan would have worked. Damn Tess's weak stomach. I took out that disc for her. She screwed up my schedule. I'll punish her, just like I wish I could punish that guy in Lila's journal, that buddy. Buddy came to see me yesterday. 
He says he knows a family who will give my baby a good home when it's born. I threw him out. Does he think that just because Tully's gone, I'd give away our child? Then a few days later, Lila wrote, Buddy comes back every day. He keeps at me to give up my baby. He says I'll never get a job on the boardwalk. The owners think I'll make the customers uncomfortable after what Tully did there. He says I'll never be able to support my baby, and his friends could give the baby everything. What am I going to do? And several days later... Buddy told me this family will pay all my rent and expenses until the baby's born if I agree that they get the baby and I don't let anyone know I'm pregnant. They wouldn't want anyone to know the baby isn't theirs. The woman has gone to Europe, and she'll tell everyone she had the baby in England. I have no money left. I have to let Buddy help me. I have no choice. No one will give me a job. I'll accept their money for now, but I'm not giving up my baby. Tess struggled through the rest of the funhouse, pushing aside the fake bats and skeletons and smoking dragons, until she reached the exit. I think I Joe went. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I, I don't know how bad she's hurt. I mean, there's no blood. I, here comes Mr. Mancini. The manager of the boardwalk, a short, squat man, pushed through the crowd around Gina and knelt down beside her. What happened? Let me check her pulse. Gina? She's alive, thank God. Did she hit her head? How long has she been lying here? Her leg looks it real bad. It's, it's broken, Mr. Mancini. Fractured, probably. It doesn't look like a clean break. Are you an expert? I'm Sam Oliver. My father's a doctor. I can't understand how this happened. Why was that circle missing? What was missing? A uh, uh, circle? Yes. One of the spinning saucers in the fun house, right up there? Oh, it yes. was gone. Gina probably didn't see the hole in the and fell through it. Oh. I can't believe it. All the saucers were in place when we were there earlier. The manager, Mr. Mancini, would have asked Tess more questions, but the ambulance arrived, and the paramedics took over. Tess wanted to go with Gina to the medical center, but Mr. Mancini stopped her. Look, uh, your friend is in good hands. You can see her later. Right now, I'd like you to show me where this happened. Okay, um, Candace, we should call Gina's parents. It's okay, Tess. Guy Joe went to call them. Oh, good. Come on, then, miss. Let's have a look at those saucers. Tess led Mr. Mancini and her friends back into the chamber. They stared at the spot where the gaping hole had been. Not a single circle was missing. It was gone. I swear it. The saucer in the middle was missing. That's how I could see Gina down there oh. on the beach. Oh, sure. Maybe someone just lifted one of those huge circles out and walked away with it without being seen. <laughs> Honestly, Tess... First you see some dark spirit under the devil's elbow, and now you're seeing missing saucers. <laughs> <laughs> I thought people like you always saw flying saucers. Knock it off, Trudy. Take it easy, Tess. You're just upset about Gina. I know what I saw. Gina couldn't have fallen any other way. Maybe she tumbled over the railing on the balcony. No, no, she wasn't clumsy. Anyway, it's too high. I think you'd better talk to the police, miss. We need to clear this up right now. I don't want any doubts about the safety of the boardwalk. Mr. Mancini took Tess's arm and led her to his office, followed by Candace, Sam's sister, looking more frightened than usual, and Guy Joe, his lips tight in anger. Two uniformed policemen were already waiting there. They asked Tess to show them the place in the funhouse where Gina had fallen. When they could find no evidence of any circle having been tampered with, they walked away from her. Isn't this the girl who brought that note in? The note in purple crayon? Yeah, one of those rich kids lives up on the hill. Broken home and all that. Probably gets everything at home, except attention. You know what I mean? Excuse yeah. me, sir. Yeah, yes. Um, if the saucer wasn't missing, how could Gina have fallen through to the beach? Yeah, well, good question. Uh, <clears throat> look, kid, you can go back to the others now. I'm sure you're all anxious to know how your friend is down at the medical center. We'll investigate this matter thoroughly. I promise. Tess knew they never would. Not unless she had some proof. She knew someone had taken the missing saucer. But who? Whoever had written that purple note. What frightened Tess most was that everyone who had been hurt so far, with the exception of innocent bystanders, had been her age and in her group of friends. Dade, Sherry, 
Joey, and now Gina. And then she realized something even more frightening. Whoever had slipped the note under her door knew that she wasn't living at her father's anymore, but was in the condominium with Shelley. Only a few people knew that, Tessa's closest friends. But none of her friends could ever do anything this horrible. Or could they? When Tess arrived at the hospital, they were all sitting there, waiting for news about Gina. Tess looked at each of them, her mind racing. Could shy, quiet Candace be hiding feelings of anger about her fellow students? Or Beak, that lover of practical jokes? Surely even he couldn't find the crash of the devil's elbow funny, could he? What about Trudy? I remember that violent temper tantrum she had in the school parking lot. Trudy, sitting there in her expensive pink jumpsuit, filing her nails and ogling Guy Joe. Could she have wanted one of her friends to suffer? What about Doth? He would know the fun house inside out. He works at the boardwalk. He'd know how to remove and replace one of those metal saucers. But Gina would be the last person in the world Doss would want to hurt. Wait a minute. That missing saucer was meant for me. And I didn't lose my keys. They were taken from my pocket. That's why I couldn't find them when I went back. And Doss could have taken them. He was standing near me when we went into the funhouse. Then he could have removed the saucer, knowing I would have to go back to search for the keys. So Gina's fall wasn't an accident. And that's what that note meant when it said, Who will be next? Tess, you cold? You're shivering. You want my jacket? No, not cold. Just thinking. Bad thoughts. I can't tell you. Suit yourself. Mind if I sit here with you? Tess didn't answer. She was watching Gina's mother, Mrs. Jamboni, who was weeping quietly. Until now, Tess hadn't considered what all this horror must be like for the parents. It's worse for them, she thought. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Jamboni? Yes. yes. I'm Dr. Oliver, Sam's father. Your daughter has a fractured leg and a mild concussion. We're going to keep her here for a while. Uh, no visitors for a day or two. Except you two, of course. You can go in and see her now. Well, can't we see her? Uh, sorry, not yet. Maybe tomorrow. But Tess stayed on at the hospital after the others had left, hoping Dr. Oliver would change his mind. She felt guilty. In a way, this was all her fault. The key case was hers. The injury should have been hers, too. Tess waited there until she was about to collapse with tiredness, but the doctor still wouldn't let her see Gina. Sadly, she hurried to her car and headed home. At the shadows, Tess parked her car, locked it, and was about to run for the house when something caught her eye. An object was hanging from the top of the light fixture beside the kitchen door. The object seemed to be white, grayish white. It looked soft and furry. Peering into the shadows, Tess moved closer. A sudden breeze sent the object swaying back and forth. Glassy blue eyes turned and stared at her coldly. No! Trilby! Trilby! Poor Tess. Did pretty kitty give her a fright? She had it coming. <laughs> Poor Trilby. <laughs> hey! Tess! What's the matter? Tess. What's happening? What's the matter? Tess, it's me. <gasps> what on earth's wrong? Look! What the he It's not real. It's stuffed. What? It's a stuffed animal, like the kind my sister has all over her bedroom. Don't you, Candace? So what, Sam? I like them. Here. Take a look, Tess. Oh, stuffed. Yeah, it looks real, though, doesn't it? It's not Trilby. Not Trilby. What's it, not... Trilby? Gina's cat. The big Siamese. Gina let it stay with me. It looks like that. <laughs> what would a cat be doing hanging from this light? Honestly, Tess, you get weirder and weirder. Shut up, Trudy. You ever hear the word compassion? It was a good thing we decided to drop by tonight. Yeah, it sure was. Guy Joe lit the candle that was on the outside table, and the group sat around it, trying to calm themselves. The candle cast an eerie, sinister glow over their faces. Or was Tess so spooked now that everyone looked sinister to her? So, Gina loaned you her cat? 
So why did you think it'd be hanging from your outside light? I didn't think it was, Trudy. It was. Why would anyone pull such a rotten stunt? Or deliberately sabotage the devil's elbow or write me a threatening well, note? You got, or, a, you got a threatening oh. note? Why didn't you tell me? Sam, the police practically laughed me out of the station when I showed them the note, so why would I tell anyone else about what it? What did it say? I'll tell you. When I got home... In the flickering candlelight, Tess repeated the note word for word. She knew it by heart. Who will be next? Could it be you? Why don't we wait and see? Oh, Tess, that's awful. You must have been so scared. I would have been. Of course you would have been, Candace. You're afraid of your own shadow. Look, this is just a big joke. It doesn't sound like a joke to me. Tess, I think you should move back to the house with Dad and me. Or at least until good old Shelley comes back. How about it? Yeah, good idea, Tess. Even if it was a joke, you shouldn't be alone after the shock you've had. The idea was tempting to Tess. It'd be so easy to let other people take care of her. But no, she'd always done that. And her father, who hadn't even called her since she moved in with Shelley, wouldn't take care of her. He'd take charge of her. Thanks, Guy Joe. But I'll go back to the condo. I need to think. And I can do that better in my own house. I'll stay with you, Tess, if you want me to. Thank you, Candace. That would be nice. Oh, great, Tess. Now I have to worry about you and my sister. Well, we'll be fine. I'll lock all the doors and windows, and I'll put my attack cat where she can be seen. Now, you guys go home. Sam, if you're so worried you can sleep in a chair out here on the porch, I'll bring you a blanket. No way. I am not freezing my buns off just because you're too stubborn to go back to your dad's. Find some other knight in shining armor. <laughs> well, chivalry is dead. Tess, you had your chance. If anything happens to you, it's your own fault. Was that a threat, Tess thought, as the group drove off? Trudy could have written the poem, and tied the animal to the light, and lifted off a saucer in the funhouse. She was strong enough. But why would she do it? Tess was glad that she had Candace with her. There was no way she could suspect Candace. Tess took her inside the house and turned on all the lights. She showed Candace where everything was, gave her her own bed, and took up a watchful position on the couch in the living room, with a poker near her hand, and Trilby soon purring contentedly on the Afghan blanket beside her. <laughs> Must be Shelley. She's forgotten the time difference. Typical. Shelly? It's your fault Tina's hurt. You messed everything up. You'll have to be punished soon. Who, um, who is this? Do you like my present tonight? Who is it? Meow. months. I waited too, in the attic. I couldn't leave until I finished Lila's journal. Buddy is taking care of all my expenses. He won't tell me who the people are who want my baby, but I think I know. If I'm right, they could give my baby everything that money could buy. Maybe my baby should have the best life possible. I can't provide it. Buddy says a good mother would care more for her child's happiness than she does for her own. Maybe he's right. Lila waited for someone to come to her rescue. No one did. She seemed to get more tired and hopeless. Buddy kept badgering her. But who was this Buddy? Was he still alive, living here in Santa Luisa? And what was Lila's journal doing in my house? Next day, the rainy season had begun and the atmosphere inside Santa Luisa High School was equally grim. A sudden, painful acquaintance with multiple tragedies had affected every student and teacher. At lunch in the cafeteria, everyone was talking about the disaster. Doesn't anyone think two accidents in less than a week is a little suspicious? Hasn't anyone heard from Police Chief Chalmers? 
You know, I heard it was a loose rail. Yeah, my dad told me that Chalmers said the rail would be fixed, and an accident like this wouldn't happen again for at least another hundred years. A yeah. loose rail? Are we supposed to buy that? Oh, Tess, there's no dire fly or no sinister doing. It's just coincidence. Look, I don't want to talk about this gloomy stuff anymore. And I'm having my birthday party Saturday night on the beach the way I planned. You're having a party now? Yes, Tess. I'm funny that way. I like to celebrate my birthday on the day I was born. You are just asking for trouble, Trudy. Haven't you noticed people have been getting hurt over there? Is that a threat, Tess? Uh, After all, you were in the funhouse when Gina fell. Cut it out, oh, Trudy. That on. is ridiculous. Shame on you, Trudy. Tess would never hurt anyone. Excuse me, please. Ignore her, Tess. She's just being mean. I'm sorry, Candace. I'm leaving. I'm not hanging around listening to that. Okay, bye. That Trudy, she has no right suspecting me. She has no right at all. Oh, wait a minute, Tess. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. At least I'm walking on my own two feet, which is more than I can say for poor Gina. Tess drove slowly through the heavy rain to the medical center, past the boardwalk, which was almost deserted. Usually it was busier in bad weather because the arcades were covered. Maybe people were afraid to go there now, Tess said to herself. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe the actual target was the boardwalk itself. Could someone want to ruin its business? Dade, Joey, Sherry, and Gina. All of them have parents who are on the board of directors that run the boardwalk. And so is my father. Now that Doss's father has had to resign, there are seven people on the board. Four of them have had children hurt. Are the others soon to follow? But who would want to cause so much tragedy? Former employee, maybe? Seeking revenge for being fired? My father might know. If I could bring myself to talk to him. Tess hurried into the medical center. She was desperate to talk to Gina. Gina could tell her who else knew that Tess had taken Trilby home with her, because whoever hung the stuffed animal on the light fixture had to have known, and they'd probably done the other horrible things, too. This time, Dr. Oliver allowed Tess to see Gina. Her head was bandaged, her cheeks were pale and gray, and her leg was held up in a pulley. Tess made sure Gina was feeling better, then leaned in closer to the bedside. Gina? Gina? Hi. Have you figured out how someone might have removed that saucer? Saucer? What saucer? The one that was missing in the fun house. The one you fell through. Oh, Tess, didn't the doctor tell you? I don't remember a single thing about yesterday. It's all a big blank to me. Does it matter? You look awfully what? worried. What's going on? I guess that means you don't remember if you told anyone I was taking Trilby home with me, right? I didn't even remember you had her. How is she? Oh, she's fine. She's great company. She shifted the talk to a safer topic, and then the whole group arrived. Guy Joe first, with Beak and Sam, and then Trudy and Candace. All soaked to the skin. Tess thought Gina's face fell when she saw that Doss wasn't there. <laughs> Guys, I hate to tell you, if Nurse Nasty finds you all here, you'll be sorry. There's only supposed to be two visitors at a time. Oh, well, Sam I'm doesn't sorry. Count. Was, I'm, I'm really glad you came, though. It's good to see you. The group joked about the nurse and chatted with Gina. Tess watched them. She couldn't believe any one of them could even pretend to hang a cat. But what about the absent Doss? He might have a motive. His father had been fired from the board of directors because of his drinking, and he'd been ruined by it. Tess's eyes shifted to charming, funny Beak, the prankster, who had once come to history class on stilts. Surely he couldn't have done those things. Then Doss finally arrived, followed by a very tall nurse. Hi, Gina. Hi, Doss. <coughs> Uh-oh, that's her. Florence Brightingale. All right, everyone. Only two visitors at a time, please. Sorry, guys. Hey, Tess, could you and Doss stay? We were just leaving. Yeah, anyway. Now, the rest of you, guys. just run along. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. You take care of yourself. You okay. too. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Tess saw Beak kiss Gina goodbye on the cheek and then flash an angry, jealous look at Doss. For a moment, Tess saw such resentment in Beak's face, she wondered if she'd made a mistake dismissing him as just a joker. Tess, you are going to Trudy's party, aren't you? 
Doss says he won't go without you. Well, something like that. Oh, no, no, I'm not going near the boardwalk. Listen, Trudy can be a pain, I know, but it is her birthday. Without us, she won't have any celebration. Yeah. I can't go, but you two can. Oh. Come on, for me. Oh, that's not fair. Oh, can't you ask me to do something easier, like giving every pet in your house a bath? <laughs> <laughs> Sam's going. Like I said, ask me to do something easier. Oh, okay, I'll go. And promise me you'll try to have a good time. Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> See you tomorrow, <laughs> Gina. See ya. As Tess left the room, Doss was smiling at Gina. Tess hoped that Doss wasn't involved in the awfulness of the past few days because it was clear as crystal that Gina was falling for him. Tess walked back to her car in the pouring rain. Soaked through by the time she reached it, she was searching for her extra car keys when she noticed her left front tire was flat as a deflated balloon. She groaned and looked at the rear tire. Completely flat, too. A feeling of dread was rising in her throat. Tess quickly ran around the car. All four tires had been deliberately slashed. <laughs> Shredded tires. A little present. I think she knows I've been following her. She keeps looking around. But I don't feel sorry for Tess or any of them. Why should I? Lila made a decision to give up her baby. I knew that would happen. I don't know what else to do. I'm so tired. And Buddy's right. I can't provide what a baby needs. He keeps telling me how much these people want a baby of their own. Doesn't that mean they'll love and care for my baby? I hope so. Anyway, it's too late now. I've signed the papers. I pray I've done the right thing. I know somehow that she didn't. Tess sagged against her car, staring at the shredded tires. Every single one of Gina's visitors knows my car. That means that one of my own friends could be after me. And I have no idea why. The police would never believe that any child of one of the board of directors was responsible for all of this. Anyway, I better get going. I don't want to be standing here stranded when Doss comes out of the hospital any minute now. Tess hurried onto the road leading up the hill towards home, alone in the wind and the rain and the darkness. Where was the tire slasher now, she thought, glancing around her. She decided she'd be safer away from the open road, where she was like a walking target. Better to take a shortcut through the woods. Low-hanging branches jumped out at her, snagging her hair, scratching her face. Several times she sunk up to her ankles in the mud and icy puddles. When she heard a noise, a soft padding sound behind her, she told herself it was a raccoon or a possum. But when the sound came again, she knew she was not alone. She stopped and listened. It was footsteps, an exact echo of her own slogging steps through the mud. Desperately, she tried to run, but her skirt, sweater, and jacket were soaking wet, weighing her down like a suit of lead. Tess! Oh, Tess! Ah! Tess froze. No. The voice was close behind her, evil and threatening. Could someone she knew well sound like that? Tess felt like sinking to the soft, muddy ground and lying there. At least then she'd find out who her tormentor was. The nightmare no. would be over. No, I won't give up. I won't. Suddenly, she left the path and veered into the deeper woods around a housing development. She saw pale lights ahead of her and went faster. Then she heard a dog. That meant there must be an owner, and an owner meant safety. Tess took a step forward and something hit her between the shoulder blades. She went down, bracing herself to hit the cold, muddy ground, but instead she felt a rush of air all around her. The earth had disappeared. She was falling, falling. I could have finished her off easy, but it's too soon. And I have no guilt. This is simple justice. Those men can't be forgiven for what they did. They wouldn't be punished at all if I hadn't found the journal. I finished it up there in the attic. I read so long my head was splitting. By the end, I knew Lila was writing only to me. Lila knew I was reading it. She knew. The baby 
was born yesterday, right here in the trailer, with the help of Buddy's doctor. But I never saw my baby. The doctor took it the minute it was born and gave me a shot. I was asleep in a minute or two, and when I woke up hours later, they were gone. All of them. Buddy came back later. He said the baby was in its new home. Then he put something on the dresser, said it was a gift from the grateful parents, and warned me that if I tried to see my baby or reveal who I was, I'd go to prison for a long time. When he left, I just sat there in the dark. Then I got up and walked to the dresser. I picked up the gift. It was a check for a great deal of money. I sold my baby. I didn't mean to, but I did. I tore the check into a million pieces. They're here, those pieces, taped to the back of this book. They're proof of what happened. And I've taped in the names of the others who were involved, besides Buddy. So now I'm going to follow Tully. My child will be cared for, and I can only pray that the cruelty its new father showed me will not be exercised on my baby. Can such a man ever love? I can only pray that he can, he and his wife. Perhaps someday, Someone will find these writings and understand my story. In that hope, I'm hiding this journal in my secret place. And now I go to Tully with a prayer that he and God will forgive me. That was the last entry. On the back cover, I found a small plastic bag fastened with yellow cellophane tape, and in it were the pieces of paper Lila had talked about. Shreds of the check body had left on the dresser. Under the bag was the list of names she'd mentioned. I knew everyone, including my own last name. Yeah. This was just the kind of thing my father would be involved in. I went and got my own cellophane tape. I was good at puzzles. I would put the pieces of the check together, and I would have the answer I needed. It seemed to Tess that she fell for a long time. Her landing was softened by a pool of muddy water. It shocked her, but aside from being covered in thick brown sludge, she was all right. Tess stood up slowly and found herself in a huge rectangular mud hole. Hoping that the angry dog above her would scare away her attacker, she began trying to claw her way up the slippery walls of the pit. But it was hopeless. She kept sliding back down. Oh, quit that barking, you stupid canine! Go get some help! Haven't you ever heard of Lassie? <sighs> Suddenly, a beam of light shone down on her from above. Hey, down there. <gasps> <laughs> Couldn't you wait until the pool was finished? Hey, are you okay? Yeah, I'll get you out of there. Could this be the person who'd been chasing her, Tess thought? No, it was an older voice. No one she knew. A rope was thrown down. Weaving in front of her like a flag of freedom. Hang on tight now, I'll haul you up. Tess hung on with every ounce of energy she had left, and slipping and sputtering against the oozing mud wall, she was dragged up to the top. Oh, look at me. Uh, how on earth did you get down there? Oh, I'm sorry I used your new pool without permission. <laughs> Aren't you Mr. Slaughter, Trudy's father? That's right. I'm Tess Landers. Oh, guy Joe's daughter? Yeah. Well, Miss Landers, how did you get into my pool? Tess couldn't say she'd been pushed. He might have called the police, and she had no answers for them. But she couldn't help thinking how close Trudy Slaughter lived to these woods. Well, um, my car broke down, and I was taking a shortcut home, but I don't have a flashlight, and I, I got lost. Oh, well, good thing Bo here doesn't like intruders. Well, Trudy isn't home, but I'm sure she'd want you to come in and borrow some dry clothes. Oh, I... I... Well, of course she wasn't home, Tess thought. She couldn't go running home so soon after pushing Tess into the pool, could she? Tess had no intention of setting foot inside Trudy Slaughter's house. I I'd really rather go to my house, Mr. Slaughter. If you could find an old blanket or something to cover your car seat, maybe you could drive me. I am covered with mud. Sure thing. I'll be right back. Tess felt he might not have agreed if he'd known she was going home to an empty house, so she didn't tell him that. When they pulled up at the condo, Sam was outside, sitting in his car. Is that your brother? Oh, no, that's Sam Oliver. 
Oh, Trent's boy. Mm-hmm. A friend of yours, I guess, though. So you'll be okay then. Hmm? Yeah, I'll be fine now. Um, thanks for everything. Okay. Tess! Hey, what happened to you? You look like you just had a mud bath. You don't look much better. <laughs> and it was true. He was almost as wet and muddy as she was. Could Sam have been running around in the woods? Tess asked herself. I'll take you to your father's. You can get cleaned up there and have a good night's sleep. No, thank you. Um, we have plenty of soap and water here. Tess, I went to the hospital to see if you'd left, and I saw what someone did to your car. Beak and Candace were pretty worried when I told them. Was Trudy with them? Uh-uh. Weren't you just with Trudy? Wasn't that her old man who brought you back? Trudy wasn't with us. I'm, uh, I'm going inside, Sam. No, wait a minute. I talked to my dad tonight. He said Chief Chalmers will be issuing a statement tomorrow saying the Devil's Elbow crash was an unavoidable accident. Huh. Maybe it was, Tess. Since when do you take your father's or Chalmers' word for anything? Now you're taking their side. There isn't any side. This isn't a war, Tess. Oh, isn't it? Good night, Sam. She marched inside and went around the house locking up. She had a long, hot bath and was heading for bed when the phone rang. This time, she thought if it was Shelley, she'd give her a piece of her mind. Hello? Happy birthday to Trudy. Happy birthday to Trudy. Happy birthday to Trudy. May she live till you die. <laughs> They're going to announce that the devil's elbow crash was caused by a loose rail. They know it wasn't. It's time to do something they can't say is accidental. I know they're worried. I even saw my father eyeing the attic door last night. Is he remembering the journal? Why didn't he get rid of it a long time ago? Ego, maybe. Well, if he does go looking for it, he'll never find it. I've hidden it. When my plan is finished, I'll send it to someone I can trust. The people of Santa Luisa have a right to the truth, like I had a right to it. It didn't take me long to put that shredded check together, and when I did, there was the signature, a name I knew well. It had signed those checks I got instead of birthday presents. My father's name. I looked at the date on the check. It was my birthday. Suddenly, everything was clear. I wasn't who I thought I was. My last name was really O'Hare. On Friday, a bulletin on Santa Luisa Radio announced that the Devil's Elbow crash had been the result of a loose rail. In the hospital, Gina told Tess that she must have fallen over a railing in the funhouse by accident. It's over and done with, Tess, she said. Can't you relax? But Tess couldn't. This wasn't the end of it. She was sure of that. On Saturday night, she went to Trudy's party. Everyone there had parents on the board. Tess hoped if she kept her eyes and ears open, she might come up with some answers. Darkness had fallen when Tess arrived on the beach below the boardwalk. The rain had stopped, and Sam and Guy Joe had already built a small cozy fire. Trudy sat in a lawn chair, dressed in a far too elegant yellow jumpsuit, like a queen waiting to greet her subjects. Candace was busy removing food from a wicker hamper. Doss arrived, then Beak, holding a bouquet of balloons. Yesterday, I'm sure it was. It wasn't. It was. It was. <laughs> hey there, birthday lady. Where are the edibles? <laughs> Here, Beak, take this temptation out of my sight. Oh. Chocolate brownies play havoc with my waistline. Yeah, watch him play with mine. Beak took two brownies, stuffed them in his mouth, donned a pink crepe paper party hat, and began dancing on the sand to the music from the cassette player. <laughs> Beak, you look like a psychotic chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, Sam! 
Oh, for Pete's sake, relax. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Nothing. You just shouldn't sneak up on people like that. Well, you look lonesome over here. I hoped you'd be more relaxed now that we know the crash was an accident. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a big relief, isn't it? You want to take a walk down to the water with me? Tess shook her head. Since she was the only one who expected something bad to happen, she needed to keep her eyes open. Maybe she could prevent another disaster. Tess hesitated, watching Doss, who was sitting off by himself. If it was Doss who caused the crash, this would be the perfect time for him to strike again. With Gina in the hospital, he wouldn't have to worry about accidentally hurting her while he targeted the others. Well then, walk up the beach a little way with me. Come on. Well, Trudy hasn't opened her presents yet. Yeah, I noticed. She's too wrapped up in your brother to unwrap presents. Oh, very funny. Wasn't supposed to be funny. I wish Trudy would open her presents and feed us. I am starved. Here, have a brownie. No, nah, too sweet and gooey. I'd be sick. Trudy promised us hot dogs. Well, while we're waiting, have a walk with me. Tess glanced over at the group cavorting on the sand. Guy Joe was held captive by Trudy, and Doss was delving into the brownie box. They looked safe enough, Tess thought. Okay, Sam, let's walk. But just for a few minutes, we can't go far. Mm -hmm. They plodded silently across the sand. The night wind tugged gently at Tess's hair, and she walked with her head down. She didn't notice until too late that they were approaching the devil's elbow. Oh, I don't want to be here, Sam. Oh, let's go back. Oh, don't be silly, Tess. The roller coaster isn't even working now. What's there to be scared of? It just gives me the creeps, that's all. You are turning into a nervous wreck. If but you don't relax, you Of course you can... I'm a nervous wreck. You would be, too. Haven't you noticed that all the kids badly hurt so far have parents on the boardwalks board of directors? What? Yes, your father is a director. Mine is that too. That never even crossed my mind. Well, can't you admit it's a possibility? That someone is out to ruin the boardwalk and hurt a lot of people at the same time? You got any idea who this crazy phantom of yours might be? No. I have a couple possibilities, but no proof. Look, I'm not saying you're right or wrong, but if you're even close to the truth, why haven't you moved back to your father's house? There's no time for someone like you to be all alone in the condo out there in the woods. I mean, someone like me? What's that supposed to mean? Why can't you take me seriously? Look, Sam, why can't you admit that everything I've said makes test, sense? Test, test. Mm. There, is that taking you seriously enough? Uh, what is that? Some kind of therapy for nervous wrecks? Well, it didn't work. I still think I'm right. And until you do too, I, I don't want to talk to you. Oh, I give up. Tess watched Sam until he became a blur in the darkness. She sat down in the sand for a while to cool off. Then she thought she'd rejoin the party. The sand was damp and soothed her fingers as she dug them into it. She watched the surf rolling softly onto the shore. Then, in the sand, Tess's fingers touched something hard and sharp. She pulled out the object and turned it towards the lights on the boardwalk. It was a stone, some sort of blue gem. Not very valuable, she thought. And then she realized, of course, it was the kind of stone worn in Santa Luisa High School rings. She never wore hers, it was too bulky, but lots of people did wear them. She stood up with the gem in her hand and looked around, frowning. She had been sitting directly beneath the devil's elbow. Could that mean the stone belonged to the person who had tampered with the roller coaster? Tess slipped the stone into the pocket of her red long-sleeved shirt and hurried back to the party. She was halfway there when the quiet hit her. There was no noise coming from the spot where her friends had been. Had they left without her? No, they wouldn't do that. Guy Joe wouldn't. Running across the hard-packed sand, her heart pounding, Tess finally heard sounds from the direction of the blankets. But they weren't party sounds. What's wrong with everybody? I don't know. They just doubled over all of a sudden a second ago. Trudy, get an ambulance! Okay, I'll be back as fast as I can. Sam, I didn't want to be right about something bad happening. I didn't. I know, I know, Tess. Let's just see if we can do something for them. We better try to keep them warm. Tess knelt by Guy Joe's side. His pain was so great he had bitten through his bottom lip. 
She took one of his hands in hers, but he gripped it so hard she cried out in pain and backed away. Sam came up to her. Tess, did you eat any brownies? What? Did you eat any of those brownies Trudy passed around? Because I didn't, and I'm fine too. And Trudy didn't. She's on a diet, but Beak and Guy Joe and Candace did. You get the picture? The ambulance arrived, and the first question the attendants asked was about booze and drugs at the party. Sam told them there was none, and he handed over the red brownie box, which was now empty except for a few crumbs. The attendants took the box without further questions and drove away with the patients. Sam, Trudy, and Tess followed in Sam's car. They were sitting once again in the waiting room of the medical center when the parents of the victims began arriving. Tess, what's going on here? What happened to your brother? And where were you when it happened? I was there, Father, and it wasn't drugs or booze. It was probably brownies. Brownies? Well, Trudy had a box of them at the party. Everyone who ate them got sick. Who made them? I guess they were a gift. The box was just there, sitting on a hamper. Well, there was no card, Trudy said. Are you sure it wasn't drugs? Well, yes, yeah. I we're sure. Hmm? Excuse me, I'm Dr. Tanner. I've uh, been pumping the kids' stomachs. They'll be okay. Miserable, but okay. We're keeping them overnight to make sure. You see, they were poisoned. Poisoned, Doctor? At my party? Well, this was no accident. Looks like rat poison. We can't be sure until we've analyzed the bit of remaining brownie. Uh, Mrs. Beecham. Yes? Uh, your son, Donald. That's his name? Doss. Everyone calls him Doss. Mm -hmm. Well, he seems to have consumed very little. Hmm. Well, I'm releasing him. Tess's first thought was that Doss knew about the poison and took only a little bit of brownie to make himself look like one of the victims. Well, I've got to get back to the others. But the police are here, and no doubt they'll want to talk to all of you, okay? Right. <gasps> oh. A depressed silence fell over the group. <clears throat> Trudy was crying quietly in a corner. But Tess wasn't impressed. After all, Trudy had acted the lead in several school plays. She was a very convincing actress. Poison. I can't believe it. Now will you move back with your dad, Tess? I'll think about it, Sam, I promise. But not tonight. Guy Joe won't be there. I, I don't want to be alone with my father. Maybe I'll go up to Gina's room and tell her what happened. Tess told Sam to take Trudy back to the beach to pick up her things. Trudy looked so shaken when she left the waiting room, it was hard to believe she was guilty. But then she was an actress. It was by now very late, and Tess had to sneak past the nurses to get to Gina's room. Gina was asleep, with only a tiny nightlight on over her hospital bed. Exhausted, but feeling safe at last, Tess curled up in a chair and fell asleep. The truth of who I was danced around the attic that afternoon. I felt the old me slide out of my body and disappear through the cracks in the wooden floor. I was gone. There wasn't any me anymore. My whole life had been a lie, so now I didn't exist. I was the O'Hare baby. I was the child who was never told the truth, never told who its real parents were, the kid who had every material possession but never an ounce of real love. Lila O'Hare would have given me that love. And Tully would have, too, if my father and his friends hadn't driven him to suicide. They stole his life. Just as my father stole Lila's journal when she died. They had to be punished, all of them. But how? What would be awful enough? And then a voice whispered in my ear. Punish their children. The men will suffer more if you do this. It was so easy to get the children. They trusted me. It's weird knowing you're not real, feeling like I'm walking around without a body, as if I'm a spirit already. I will be soon. I'll join my parents. Why not? I have no life here. But before I go, I have to teach Tess a lesson. But I have to hurry. Chalmers could trace the poison to my house. The hardware store keeps records of all the poison sales. What makes me really angry is that I never found out who Buddy was. I can't ask the people who would know. My so-called father and his friends. It'd be too suspicious. No. The only thing left is to punish Tess. I'm going to take her with me when I go.
Tess, Tess, wake up. Oh. Are you all right? What on earth are you oh. doing here? Oh, hello, Mrs. Jamboni. I, um, I stayed here overnight. You see, I thought it might be safer because I wasn't... What is it, Mom? <sighs> Tess, when did you get here? What's happened? Oh, it's okay, Jean. I just slept here last night. You see, when we were at Trudy's party... Without mentioning her suspicions about Trudy and Doss, Tess told Gina about the night before. Gosh, Tess, you better stay at my house until the police come up with some answers. Right, Mom? Of course. Tess is always welcome. Oh, no, thank you, Mrs. Jamboni. It's okay. I'm going home with my brother, Guy Joe. You know my dad's house. It's a fortress. Tess promised Gina that she would come back later and went to see Guy Joe in his hospital room. She arranged to go home with Guy Joe and their father later that morning. Their drive home was a solemn one. Guy Joe and his father hardly spoke. The darkening sky promised more rain, and their big house looked gloomy and forbidding when they drove up. But at least, Tess thought, she wouldn't be alone there. Mr. Landers left them at the front door and went off to work. Tess and Guy Joe went straight to their rooms. Tess showered and crawled into bed and was asleep within minutes. She slept the whole day, waking only when Maria the housekeeper called her for dinner at 6.30. Tess thought of her promise to go see Gina that night, and her heart started to pound. I can't go out alone, she thought. It's too risky. Dressing quickly in jeans and the red top from the night before, she hurried downstairs to dinner. I'm uh, having a meeting tonight. Robert Rapp is picking me up. Tess, you can use my car if you have somewhere to go. Oh, thanks. Well, I promised Gina I'd take her something to read. Well, I'll be back early. Tess thought if she were in her dad's car, she'd be safe. Anyone watching for her would think that her father was in the car. Then she remembered what she'd wanted to ask. Father, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, have you or anyone else on the board fired someone recently? Oh, no one besides Beecham quite a while ago. Why? Well, all of the kids who've been hurt have parents on the board. Doesn't that seem awfully coincidental to you? Exactly right. Coincidence. Nothing more. Charmers will handle things. You go on and have a good time. You have any plans tonight, Guy Joe? Not me. I'm wiped out. I'm just going to sack out and take life easy. Very well. I'll see you both later. Okay. Bye. Well, he hasn't changed much, has he? <laughs> Do you think he might have? Isn't hope supposed to spring eternal? Not in this house. Tess went upstairs to look for her old yearbooks. She thought Gina would get a kick out of reading them again. When she didn't find them in her bedroom, Tess decided the housekeeper must have put them away somewhere. She would have to look for them. She put a soothing George Michael cassette into her Walkman, snapped it onto her chain belt, clamped the earphones on her head, and began her search for the yearbooks. It took a while. The last room she entered was large and dark. She switched on the overhead bulb and glanced around. The yearbooks could be in any one of a dozen boxes and trunks, that trunk in the corner, maybe. Before she could open it, she would have to take all that junk off the lid. What were those things, anyway? Tess picked up the first object, a Santa Luisa high school ring, without its usual blue stone. And her red leather key case. Beside it lay a paper napkin, exactly like the ones Trudy had had at her birthday party. The tiniest traces of chocolate cookie crumbs clung to one edge. A pulse in Tessa's throat began to beat double time, out of sync with the drums in her headphones. Then she saw one more object, a large, fat, purple magic marker. Tess took off her headphones and picked up the ring to examine it more closely. What does all this mean? What are all these things doing lying here so neatly, so well-ordered? It's like a... it's like... it's like a shrine. Well, good for you. Oh, oh, God, Kai Joe. That's exactly what it is, a shrine. To my mother, actually. A shrine? To our mother? Not our mother, stupid. My mother. We didn't have the same one, you know. What are you talking about? Of course we did. No, they stole me right out of my mother's arms, and now they're paying for it. And you, you're gonna pay too, because it was your father who kept the truth from me. Tess felt dizzy. Did he mean he wasn't her real brother? That was crazy. Then she looked again at the objects laid out on the trunk. The ring, the key case, the napkin. 
Each of them had something to do with one of the accidents. Which meant... Yes, they're proof. I did it. All of it. And it was so easy. This town is so full of fools. Oh, God, Joe, you wouldn't. I wouldn't? Oh, wouldn't I, huh? Well, this is justice test, pure and simple. They asked for it. They stole me and they kept the truth from me. I don't understand. You don't have to. All you have to do is come with me. What? No! <clears throat> you will do exactly what I tell you. You fouled things up enough for me already. What are you going to do? We are going to have some fun. And if you're thinking about screaming, go right ahead. Maria went home and your father, in case you've forgotten, is at one of his precious meetings. Now get down those stairs. We're going on a trip and we're going to meet my real parents. You like them, Tess. Well, where do they live? Live? They don't live, Tess. Your father and his friends drove them to suicide. They're dead. And what was good enough for them is good enough for us. Now get outside and get in the car! No! Gaijo threw her into the car and snapped on the electronic locks. He yanked her seatbelt across her. You try to unhook it and I'll break your arm. Tess knew he meant it. Just as she knew from his eyes that he was telling the truth about his past. Why hadn't he been told a long time ago? To find out when you were 18 years old must have been a terrible shock. Enough, Tess realized, to send her brother over the edge. You pushed me into Trudy's pool? <laughs> and the brownies? Mm -hmm. You did that too? <clears throat> and then you ate some so no one would suspect you, right? Clever, huh? Yeah, miserable experience, but necessary. The saucer in the funhouse? How were you able to lift it well, up? Those things wear out fast, and then they're easy to lift. I just put it onto the saucer beside it, and you were standing on it, and then I slipped it back when I went to call Gina's parents. Gajo, I don't know how you found out about your past, but you could be wrong. And anyway, it doesn't matter to me. It matters to me, I'll you stupid, you... selfish little witch. If you don't understand anything else before you die, understand that. Get out. This side. I'm taking you to your favorite place, the fun house. And if you so much as look at anyone else in the way, you're done for. Tess did see someone, someone she knew. Doss was sitting in the shooting gallery, but he hardly noticed her. And why should he, Tess thought, after the way she had treated him. When they reached the fun house, Guy Joe bought two tickets and pushed Tess inside. Go ahead and scream, Tess. No one will even notice in here. Now, take your shoes off. Oh, Guy Joe, I can't go through this place in my bare feet. Didn't I make myself clear? Do what I say. <sighs> this fun house is the last place your feet will ever touch. No, no, Guy Joe, stop! He dragged her into the nylon padded tunnel with the rolling wooden floor. Tess tried to clutch at the wall covering, but her hand slipped on the nylon and she fell. Guy Joe watched her struggling, then threw her into the next chamber. Guy Joe, please! <sighs> I don't know exactly where my father died, so I'll just have to pick my own spot. Gaijo, why are you doing this? Because you're his child, and I'm punishing but him. But he's not even here. He doesn't know. <laughs> he will. He will. It's all in the journal I left back there, and he'll know what fun we had before the end. Now up you get. No! Get up! I'm going to hang us both from those two skeletons in the middle chamber. What? <laughs> oh, the field. Hang us? <laughs> yeah. My father did it. It said so in the paper. I saw it in the library. And like father, like son, right now. Now this will be our hanging rope, nylon. Good and strong. Around no. your neck first. <laughs> All right. Now, move into the next chamber. I can't, Kai Joe. I it. can't go across those chains Try in my it. bare feet. I can't. Try it, or I'll finish you off right here. He meant it. This wasn't the brother she knew. Whatever he had learned about himself, it had made him a person who could kill. He shoved Tess across the chain floor. The metal sliced into her bare feet, but somehow she managed to reach the wooden platform on the other side. Ah! Uh, I can't walk, Guy Joe. I've cut my foot. Let me see. There. Guy Joe bent down to look at her foot just long enough for Tess to grab the chain belt at her waist and unclasp it. In one motion, she yanked the belt free from its loops and swung it down hard across the back of Guy Joe's head. Uh. Guy Joe fell to his knees and Tess ran into the next chamber where the metal saucers whirled. She had only a second. She bent down and grabbed at the middle circle. It came up out of the floor easily, just as Guy Joe had said. Using what little strength she had left, Tess tossed the circle into the next passageway. Footsteps were coming up behind her. Tess made her way quickly across to the opposite side of the chamber. Then, taking careful aim, she swung her chain belt upwards at the overhead light, and the chamber was plunged into darkness. Tess crouched on the wooden walkway, trembling violently, waiting. Tess! Tess! I'll get you! I'll get you for this, Tess Landers! You won't get away! You're gonna be very sorry! Tess! Tess!
Tess would hear Gaijo's scream in her sleep for many nights to come. Crouching in the corner of the chamber, she covered her face with her hands. Then she heard a familiar voice. Tess? Tess? Tess, where are you? I'm here. Oh, be careful, Sam. There's a saucer missing. Are you okay? How did you know I was here? Gina, she called me. She got this weird package today from Guy Joe. A couple of journals. One was his, and the other was an old one, written by some woman. Gina was scared for you. She told me to find you right away. Then Doss called and said you and Guy Joe were here, and that Guy Joe looked funny. Kind of freaked out. So here I am. So Doss had noticed something strange after all, and hadn't ignored it. She would have to remember to thank him. Where's Guy Joe now? Down there. Guy Joe was lying unconscious on the sand. He looked so helpless, so innocent. Tess found it hard to believe the night's horror had actually happened. Sam, we'd better call another ambulance. But this will be the last one. They think I'm unconscious, but I heard every word they said. Dr. Oliver said to my supposed father, we've had our hands full with these kids, haven't we? Buddy Slaughter tells me Trudy is really upset. So, I found out in the end. The buddy Lila wrote about was Trudy's father, and I hadn't punished him yet. Okay. No sweat. I'd go wherever they sent me. I'd weave little baskets and I'd talk to shrinks. But I'd get out someday. And when I did, Buddy Slaughter, the man who had stolen everything from me, would be waiting. I could wait too. That was The Fun House by Diane Ho. It was adapted and directed by Garrick Hagen. Music and studio production by John Mayfield. Tess was played by Laurel Lefko, Guy Joe by William Marsh, and Lila by Barbara Barnes. Gina was played by Tony Barry. Sam by Adam Henderson. Beak and Mr. Slaughter by William Dufries. Trudy was played by Laurence Bouvard, Candace by Stacy Jefferson, Doss and the Police Sergeant by David Jarvis. The narrator was Liza Ross. The Funhouse was a Story Circle production for Scholastic Publications.